Hello, my name is Michael Brown, and it's my pleasure to be with you today to share a little of my insights into training CPA review faculty who deliver the Becker Review course. I am uh, very pleased to be here in China and have the opportunity to record this for you. I hope that you will find it beneficial and may be able to adapt some of the techniques I'm going to talk about and some of the knowledge hopefully I can share to make your classroom presentations that much more effective. Let's take a look at our agenda for the day. After a brief introduction, I'm going to start by laying some good groundwork for the exam structure and content. And I'm going to try provide a little of additional information beyond just the facts. Some information that you may find particularly useful and may even wish to share with your students as you're presenting. I'm going to touch briefly on anticipated changes to the exam. I feel that it's critically important that all review course faculty are aware of what's going on with the exam and what may be coming uh, in the next few years. So I'll share both process by which the AICPA makes modifications to the exam, as well as some of the things that are being considered. Uh, we'll see what the final results may be. Then I'm going to spend some time walking you through what's called the Becker Learning Approach. In short, it answers the question of why we do what we do, why the lectures are set up the way they are, why the homework is set up the way it is, why we recommend students to proceed through the course in a particular order. By laying that first, it then will be that much easier for me to walk you through some techniques that our instructors use to prepare for their lectures and also some best practices you may, able to, may be able to adapt as you teach. And I want to finish with arguably one of the most important intangible skills that a review course instructor can provide, which is motivation. Uh, it goes without saying that preparation for the CPA exam is an arduous process. It's long, it takes a lot of hours to be effective, and so it's incumbent upon instructors not just to impart knowledge and skills and strategy, but also motivation and encouragement. So I want to talk a little bit about that toward the close. So just a little bit about my background. I, I feel it's important that you understand who I am and where my background lies. So first and foremost, I am a CPA. Uh, I'm also now a CGMA. And my experience is somewhat varied, uh, including public accounting, corporate accounting, and then ultimately education working for Becker. I started with Ernst & Young in the Atlanta Assurance Practice. Atlanta, if you're not familiar with it, is in the southeastern United States, one of the largest cities in that part of our country. I worked with clients in manufacturing, financial services, and retail. Following that, I spent several years uh, in corporate roles, controllers and accounting managers, positions both in real estate and service. After I relocated to Pennsylvania, I now live near Philadelphia, I moved into a role with Becker, ultimately landing as one of their regional faculty managers. Now, the faculty management team, there are only three of us that handle the United States. I'm responsible for the eastern part of the country, which gives me oversight for over 200 Becker faculty. And I'm responsible for looking at potential new instructors as part of my job, involving uh, training, both on-site and online, and what ongoing development we have uh, for our instructors to make sure they remain the very best they can be. In addition, I have the great pleasure to teach. I teach financial accounting, auditing, and occasionally some of the BEC or business subjects, both in our Philadelphia classrooms and as one of Becker's national instructors. If you watch the videos, you'll currently see me on the fourth and fifth audit lectures, the fourth business lecture, and in November of 2014, I will be added to the sixth business lecture as well. But that's enough about me. I, I sense you're not sitting there to learn about my life story. You want to know about how to help your students, so let's move into the exam structure and content. I think it's really important that every instructor fully understand exactly how the CPA exam is built, exactly what goes into its structure. So we're going to start by taking a look at financial and audit. We can put them together because their structures are identical. They're designed exactly the same way. Now, the first thing that's important for you and your students to understand is they're made up of what are called testlets. Now, testlet, I will assure you, you will not find it in any English dictionary. 
It's a word, I believe, that was created by the AICPA. All it really means is the student effectively has to take four tests in sequence in order to complete the exam. Now that starts with three testlets comprised of 30 multiple choice questions each, or 90 questions in total. That's followed by seven task-based simulations, which is, again, kind of a fancier term than I think is necessary. Really, all these are are seven medium-length problems, usually that involve a student answering a series of questions or perhaps answering a question that has multiple parts, or sometimes both. 60% of their score currently comes from the multiple choice, and that's part of why you'll find that multiple choice receives uh, more emphasis in our course, and that's the driving reason why most of the students' points are still coming from multiple choice. The remaining 40% comes from the simulations. It's also worth noting that financial and audit are each four hours in length, and it's up to the student, of course, to manage that full four hours. The clock starts with question one, testlet one, and either they successfully reach the end or the time runs out. Either way, that's when their test is over. Now, regulation follows a similar structure, as does business. But here's the differences. Number one, regulation and business are both three hours in length instead of four. So if we look at regulation, you basically see that it's the same format, only shorter. So instead of 30 questions per testlet, we only have 24 for 72 in total. Instead of seven simulation tasks, there are only six. But other than that, it's structurally the same. And again, point value is split 60-40. Now business is different. I realize I'm somewhat blocking it, but what I can tell you is the first part is identical to regulation. It starts with 72 multiple choice questions and three testlets. The difference here being that's 85% of the business score. The remaining 15% comes from written communication. It's the only portion of the CPA exam that tests a candidate's ability to write, in effect, of, in effect to communicate using the written word. That's 15%. Again, regulation and business are both three hours. So it's really easy, at least now, uh, the previous version of the exam had lengths including half hours, but now, pretty simple, financial and audit are four hours each, regulation and business are three hours each. Now, some other items. Within these simulations, so for financial, audit, and regulation, out of the simulations they're going to complete, one of them is a research task. So that's a little bit different. It basically challenges the student with a technical question. In financial, it would be something on U.S. GAAP. In auditing, it would be most likely from the U.S. audit standards, but it can also be from the ethics standards. It can be from compilation or review standards as well. Uh, but it asks the student to find the relevant literature. And for regulation, it almost certainly is going to come from the Internal Revenue Code, the U.S. Uh, tax regulations. The challenge for the student is not to know what the answer is to the question. No, the challenge is for the student to locate where in those authoritative literature bodies the correct answer can be found. So that's one of the questions they're going to face. But there's one other thing I really want to mention, and it's, it's less talked about in the CPA exam. Now, I realize that what's really important here is to notice the numbers. But there's an easy way to remember this, one-sixth. One-sixth of the questions that you're going to see during the exam. So for financial and audit, that's 15 of the multiple choice and one simulation. For regulation, that's 12 of the 72 multiple choice and one simulation. And for business, that's, again, 12 multiple choice. And granted, it's one-third, but one of the written communication questions. Now, you might ask yourself, why are you talking about some percentage of the questions? Well, these are how many don't count. See, this is not something, and for any of you who have worked with other standardized tests, this is a very common technique used in standardized tests to test out brand new questions. Or if the examiners have determined that a question they have been using is statistically invalid, perhaps the question is ambiguous, it's too challenging, it's too easy. Well, what they'll do is rework the question and then make it one of these. It's well, basically like a blind taste test. 
they don't want this candidate to know which questions are regular four points and which ones are these sampling or pretest questions. Now, some students have asked me, well, what good does it do me to know this? A couple of things. One is it helps to underscore the point that no one question is that important. No one question is going to make or break you on the CPA exam, and that's particularly true when you consider that there's a chance it doesn't count at all. It helps to emphasize for the student that spending too much time on any one question is also unworthy of their time. It's more important that they manage their time throughout the entire course of the exam so that they can reach every question and have enough time to consider it fully. The other reason is when new material can be tested. I frequently make a point in speeches and in the classroom of reminding students about the six-month rule. Once a new pronouncement is issued, the FASB issues a new update, the audit standard, a new audit standard is released, a new portion of the tax code is adopted. Once it has its effective date, it can be tested six months later. Now, what I like to joke with students is say, do you think the AICPA is going to wait six months to start writing questions? Certainly not. They're going to take the opportunity to begin developing those questions so that when the six months have elapsed, they're ready. So every so often, a student may run into one of these questions and have that realization of, this wasn't in the book. I don't remember this at all. Or perhaps they say, I heard about this at my job. I remember someone sending out an alert about a new financial standard. Now, the good news is if the student remembers that, wait a minute, that's not been out for six months, that means they've identified one of those pretest questions because that's when, that's one way you can notice which ones they are. So again, it helps the student realize, okay, it's not worth me spending a lot of time worried about this question that I haven't seen before. Make my best guess, but have some level of confidence that this is likely not one of the questions that's going to affect my score. All right, let's talk a little bit about exam content. Now, I'm going to walk through this kind of graphically, but I'm also going to try to emphasize those areas, at least for American students where they struggle. Now, I can't say, of course, whether that translates for Chinese students, uh, where their foundation may be relatively strong or relatively weak, but I just want to share it with you uh, just as a point of interest. Uh, and, and so you have a sense, uh, or perhaps can reassure your students, they're not alone in struggling with certain material. Let's start with financial accounting. And if we look from the, what we would say, the 12 o'clock position and work clockwise, we can see that that is about 80% of the financial exam, uh, and that is financial accounting. Straightforward U.S. gap. Now, the examiners, a couple of things to note. One is they never say specifically what the percentage is. They always will give a range. So you can never be certain there would be exactly this many questions on any one subject, but it's going to fall somewhere within the range. So we can say that about 30%, they call it financial statement accounts, but really what that's focused on is about 30%, the format, content, and uh, layout, if you will, of the core financial statements, the balance sheet, the income statement, statement of cash flows, as well as the footnotes. The other 30%, they call specific transactions, and I like to say that's, well, how do you account for X, whatever X is whether that's asset impairment, pension expense, deferred taxes, deferred revenue, anything. Obviously, this is kind of a blurry line. It's kind of hard to say exactly where this ends and this begins, but that's why I say it's pretty fair to say about 60% is knowing the roots, knowing the specifics of the accounting. Now, the other 20%, is largely focused on the conceptual framework and the standard setting process. Now, although we mention IFRS in this pie slice, I want to give you a more general comment. The AICPA has told us that approximately 10% of a candidate's financial score will be driven by IFRS content. Now, I would wager to say that in this particular instance, your students actually have an advantage over American students, insofar as many of them have had limited exposure to IFRS 
if any at all. And it's entirely likely if they've started working, they may very well not be working on clients that have any IFRS issues. So they're really having to learn for the first time in many cases this material. But what they focus on with IFRS is where are the key differences? Where are U.S. GAAP and IFRS fundamentally different? That's a tall order. That's a lot of information. But one of the things you'll note in our textbook that we make a point of doing is highlighting within the body of the outline where those differences between U.S. GAAP and IFRS are. You may want to recommend to your students as well that at the back of each financial lecture in our text, there's a summary table, a chart of all the significant differences discussed in that chapter. It's a wonderful review tool, and students that are more comfortable with IFRS may find it an effective way to focus their studies because then they can say, all right, if it's not a major difference, my knowledge of IFRS is equal to my knowledge of U.S. GAAP. Now, where a lot of American students struggle are these two pieces up here, governmental accounting and not-for-profit accounting, about 10% each. The reason is simple. Many universities don't offer this at the undergraduate level. If they do, it likely is only an elective. Some will only offer it as a graduate course, and then again, it may only be as an elective, not a required course. So we actually assume, particularly with governmental accounting, that a student has never been exposed to this previously to coming to Becker. That's why the eighth financial lecture, or F8, tends to be a little bit different than many of our other lectures because it actually goes and tries to rapidly lay a foundation that may otherwise not be there. The good news is always keep in mind those percentages. 10% is not that much. When you consider that 90 questions are all the AICPA has in the financial exam, something on the order of 8 or 9 or 10 questions on each of these subjects is probably a reasonable expectation. So it's not that much. It's more knowing what makes these two different than U.S. GAAP. Let's take a look at audit. Now, this may be a little cluttered, but what I want to focus your attention on is everything but the top two slices of the pie. So I'm really looking from here clockwise around to here. In short, that's about two-thirds of the exam, and it roughly follows the standard sequence of an audit engagement. Let's look. Over here, we have engagement acceptance and understanding the assignment. That's about 14%, so that's the initial stage of the audit. Uh, client acceptance, client continuance, uh, the ex you know, defining the engagement, the engagement letter, understanding what the client requires, any deliverables, and so forth. Following that, we can go to this side. About 18% find is understanding the entity and its environment. So that is understanding our client, understanding the industry and the environment in which it operates, and understanding its internal control. Based on that knowledge and the risk assessment that follows, we complete this phase, about 18% performing actual audit procedures, substantive audit procedures as well as substantive tests of controls, and evaluating that evidence, leading us to the final piece, about 18% on evaluating findings, required communications, and ultimately audit reporting. Now that's the sequence in which it's laid out here. That's kind of how an audit engagement works. I would make a quick note that this is actually not the order in which we cover it in our text. We start here. We actually focus on reporting first because we feel that you're kind of beginning with the end in mind. First, we want to show the students this is the final destination. This is the objective we're trying to reach. Now, let's walk through all the steps that get you there. It also allows us to cover two distinctly different sections side by side. We focus on audit reporting issues in A1. We focus on all other kinds of CPA engagements in A2, again, focused in no small part on reporting. And that's about 14% of the exam covering compilations and reviews. The final section, this purple one up here, about 18%, is professional responsibilities. In 2011, the AICPA redesigned the CPA exam. One of the changes they made was to split off one piece of ethics. Previously, all knowledge about ethics, professional, and legal responsibilities were tested as part of the regulation exam. However, 
there are specific ethical and professional responsibilities that are applied beyond that to auditors. And so the examiners determine that the code of professional conduct and the rules laid out by the PCAOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, were more relevant to the auditing exam. And so that's why this piece is now here. But it's focused solely on the impact of those responsibilities on auditors and other assurance services. Now, I will fully confess, if you ever send me an email about regulation, I probably can't help you. Regulation is my least favorite subject. As you noted earlier, I worked in auditing and I've worked in accounting. I have never worked in tax and, frankly, never want to. Um, what I find is, you know, I tell students frequently that folks who go into audit oftentimes don't like tax, and those that go into tax frequently don't like audit. A good solution? Make friends. Usually someone, if you can form a study group that includes someone in audit and someone in tax, they can help each other out with their weaknesses. But in any case, let's take a look at the reg exam. Again, we're going to look at about two-thirds to start with, right here from the blue section all the way around to this brown section, is taxation. And they break it up into four pieces. About 16% is the taxation of individuals. Uh, granted, it may not be as common over here, but if I told an American audience that's a Form 1040, believe me, everyone knows that one. Because once you start earning income in the United States, it's not long before you have to file a Form 1040 with the Internal Revenue Service. But this is all the various impacts on the individual. The biggest piece is up here. About 21% is taxation of entities, and, and the biggest one of those is C-corporations, although testing of S-corps and partnerships are certainly part of that as well. About 14% focuses on the taxation of property transactions, and the final 13% deals with well, I like to say the overlap, where accounting and taxation overlap and some of the issues and tax procedures that emerge. So again, about two-thirds from tax. Now, I mentioned that the body of ethics used to be tested on regulation. Well, what we can say now is that all of that same knowledge, less the piece that's now tested on audit, is tested here. So general ethical, professional, and legal responsibilities of a CPA are covered here. Leaving one more section, about 19% business law. Again, this is U.S. business law, and I've already heard, I've had the pleasure of speaking to a couple of uh, audiences of CDL students, and this is actually an area they're concerned with, and part of it being that there are some things in U.S. law that simply don't exist in Chinese law, so it's really learning it for the very, very first time. To help put your students' minds at ease, one good thing to note is it is only 19%. That is not a significant piece compared to tax, certainly. I think it's interesting to note that when I took my CPA exam back in uh, 1999, law was its own part. It was one of the four. So it's interesting that in the period of about 15 years, it has gone from being one-fourth of the exam to being about one-fifth of one part of the exam, so much less uh, significant than it once was. And then we have business. Now, I joke with my audiences that business is the miscellaneous and other exam. It's really a, well, I'm not sure if there's a translation, but uh, in English we say hodgepodge, but it's a mix of a lot of different topics. But put them all together, it's the AICPA's belief that being a CPA is more than just being an accountant. It's more than just being an auditor or a tax per, uh, preparer or a tax consultant. It's a business advisor. It's someone who's knowledgeable about a range of business subjects. So they feel that it's necessary to maintain that brand, if you will, to test that broad range of business content for CPA exam candidates. And that's what you see represented here. Roughly six, well, I can't quite say they're all equal, but you can tell that they all fall between, say, the smallest at 12% to the largest at about 21%. So they're all pretty close together. Let's just walk through them. First, financial management. What usually aligns with a finance course, a university course, or perhaps a course in corporate finance, 
18% focused on governance. Now, that's new. Uh, that was added in 2011. A lot of uh, candidates are confused as to why this is here and not auditing, because a lot of them immediately think of the role of the audit committee. Well, yes, and the role of the audit committee certainly is tested as part of the auditing exam. But what I like to tell students is, well, what about the rest of the year when the auditors aren't present? Does governance disappear? Certainly not. The audit committee has an ongoing role. The board of directors has an ongoing role in the governance and oversight of the company. And that's what we're focused on here. About 18% economics, core concepts of macro and microeconomics. About 17% is accounting, or sometimes you'd say management information systems, but it's the impact largely of technology on the profession. And I put the last two together. About 14% designated as operations, and about 12% on strategy. That's a little bit misleading because buried in there is cost and managerial accounting. So issues like variance analysis and break, I should say break even points and costing and job cost and some of those concepts are tested here as well in addition to tactical and strategic management. So that's the business exam and that's a walkthrough of each of the four parts in some detail. Now, I mentioned that students sometimes struggle with governmental accounting. Now, the other area that sometimes gets some struggles is just the mix of this exam. What most American students tell me is they don't feel this exam is particularly difficult, but where it can be dangerous is that in many cases, the courses at college they took related to this subject matter usually were some of the earliest courses they took. And so it's not so much that economics may be that challenging, but if they took it three or four years ago, well, that knowledge isn't very fresh in their mind. So it just is a matter of investing the time to bring that knowledge back to the surface for the exam. Unfortunately, some students look at this list and say, well, that's very general. I don't really need to spend much time studying that. And that can be a critical mistake. So next, I'd like to give you, well, we, we'd say a, a glimpse into the crystal ball. Basically, what might be coming? And the term you're going to start hearing perhaps a bit more is CBT3. Now, I will fully confess that I like to make fun of the AICPA, and I feel like I'm entitled. They write this exam. I had to take this test, and so I get to poke a little fun. And in this case, I have to poke a little fun at what CBT stands for. Nothing fancy. It's computer-based test. Yeah. So the original exam released in 2004, I should say the original computerized exam, was called the CBT. In 2011, they released the second generation, which is called the CBT-E. E for evolution. So we're anticipating in 2000. 18, perhaps 2017, we're going to see what's now being called the CBT-3. That's the third generation of the CPA exam. What I'd like to start with is walking you through the process that the AICPA is and will follow to go through this and ultimately make revisions to the CPA exam. And it starts with the exploration. Now, they call this entire process practice analysis. But it starts here. And this process, this piece, is already underway. In 2014, they're working on the step called exploration. It involves quantitative research, a lot of electronic surveys and the like. What they're trying to understand is what skills do brand new CPAs need today? What knowledge do they need today? And how important is each? What's most important, somewhat important, not very important or simply not something they need to know. So it's trying to understand how things have changed since the last time they went through this process. As we move to 2015, we'll move to the confirmation stage. So based on all the knowledge gained here, they're now going to say, well, this is what we believe. Let's make sure. So it's confirming those results. And they're going to do that by surveying a great deal more CPAs, not just now staff, but also they're going to ask firms and say, does this meet your expectations? Is this what you see from your new hires? 
It also is going to include perhaps focus groups. The AICPA uses a broad range of techniques to, well, really just make sure they've got it right. So by the end of 2015, they anticipate being done with this stage, and then they'll move to the third stage of the process, referred to as design. This is actually where they'll take all of this information and decide what changes they actually want to make. And that could be, well, anything. That includes the content, the skills, the length of any of the exams, and the structure of any of the exams. Literally, if they want to, they could redesign this from the ground up, literally build a brand new CPA exam, if they want to. But they're going to base it upon these results, because they always want to make sure the CPA exam tests what brand new CPAs should know. Now, after they complete this design work, they're going to go through an exposure phase. And funny enough, this is very much like how the FASB operates. They go through research, develop an exposure draft of a new piece of accounting rules, and they put it out to the public. So they ask the firms and the societies, industry, and CPAs, well, what do you think? And the same thing is going to happen here. They're going to put out those proposed changes and all the stakeholders. And you can imagine in the United States and, frankly, all around the world, that will include universities, firms, CPA review courses, uh, industry, government. A lot of people obviously have a significant stake in what happens to this exam. And that also includes, in the U.S., all the specific jurisdictions. So, in short, the AICPA is making a proposal, but the boards of accountancy in each jurisdiction, from Guam to my home state of Pennsylvania, will also have comments. Now, based on that, they'll make revisions. So, they'll take the feedback during this exposure period and make modifications and finalize the design of the new CPA exam. Now, how do they finalize it? Well, it will be a new version of what's called, in short, the CSO-SSO, which stands for the Content Specification Outline Skills Specification Outline. It's the AICPA's official listing of everything that can be tested on the exam and how they can test that knowledge. So, obviously, this is the foundation of the exam. It's what we actually use when we write the materials in our textbooks. So this is where the final design will be represented. Once they have that, the last stage is to formally announce the new exam, and that would include when the new exam will go into effect. So here's the question. What might they change? Well, at this point, it's really speculation. So I have to make that disclaimer that I'm not promising any of these will happen. I can't promise that even if they do, they won't happen to a different degree. But I do want to give you a glimpse into what the AICPA is thinking and what, you know, for my part at least, what I think may happen. So the first question. Today, as I mentioned earlier, the majority of the points come from multiple choice questions. Is the AICPA happy with that? And the answer is no. They've specifically stated that they believe simulations are the best type of question to assess candidate capability. Therefore, we believe, and they have it indicated, that simulations will take a greater role in the CBT3. How much? Well, I like to say that nothing is off the table here. They have talked about perhaps as much of a switch to 80-20, which would be a massive move for the CPA exam, meaning 80% of the points from simulations, 20% from the multiple choice. Do I believe that will happen? Probably not that dramatic. However, I do look at the fact that the CBT version 1, it was 70-30. The CBTE version 2 was 60-40. So I would say at least 50-50 is reasonable to expect. And I wouldn't be surprised if they just flip it. If they say, well, today it's 60-40 in favor of multiple choice. In the new version, it's going to be 60-40 in favor of simulations. We'll see what kind of a fight they get when they, depending on where they go with this, but I think at least seeing increasing importance of the simulations is a pretty safe bet. What about the content? Is anything assured to remain on the exam? 
Well, it's a surprisingly short list. There's only three subjects that the AICPA has specifically said are safe, meaning they're going to be there. And they make sense. Financial accounting, auditing, and taxation are safe. Anything and everything else is vulnerable. So changing how many points they're worth, certainly, potentially removing something that's on the current exam or adding something that hasn't been tested previously, they're all within the realm of possibility. Note a couple of things. The importance of three topics I have noticed has consistently decreased since the paper and pencil exam. Cost accounting, managerial accounting, and business law. Now, I can't say whether that will stop here, or is it possible that we would see those disappear? I don't know. I, I can't speculate, and I certainly wouldn't want to set an expectation and be wrong. But I think it's interesting that the AICPA has laid that broad of a window of what they could change. Third, what about a change in the number of exams? Again, apparently nothing's off the table. They've said perhaps they'll go to five parts instead of just four. Now, that's not unprecedented. Back in the day, well before I took the CPA exam, the CPA exam actually did have five parts. A more interesting proposal, and I'm told one that isn't unprecedented on the global stage, is having four exams, and only when you pass those four can you take the final capstone fifth exam. Now, this would be a radical departure, because no time in the history of this exam have we had sort of a multi-stage testing process. But it's interesting to see that they're at least considering that. The final question, and of course of paramount concern to us, when? Well, the AICPA has said that 2016 is likely the earliest, and I would be stunned if they would move that fast. Um, I think 2017 is a more realistic, if aggressive, target. 2018, probably a realistic and conservative target. I think 2019 would be pretty late. I'm not saying it won't happen. Uh, but if nothing else, I'm willing to say, well, there were seven years between the CBT and the CBTE. So I feel comfortable saying about seven years to the next generation of exam is not an unrealistic expectation. So perhaps January 1st of 2018 will be the day. We'll see. Uh, this picture will get more and more clear as we move forward and as the AICPA moves forward through its process.